that mathematics and logic, assuming there's a difference, rests on a few basic axioms that cannot themselves be proved. How are these to be justified? Frege accepts them, in effect, as given a priori to anyone who understands mathematics and logic. Unfortunately, he has very little more to say about this, a crime for which he was punished by a just God. Since his famous axiom five on the existence of sets and identity was shown by Russell's paradox uh, to reduce his entire system to logical inconsistency. There's something very tragic and ironical about Frege. By the way, the greater the logician, the more likely you'll contradict yourself because you speak precisely. <laughs> Whereas the intuitive mathematician is sufficiently vague that uh, problems don't arise. It's not an accident that Church's theorem, Church's theory had an inconsistency, Quine's theory had an inconsistency, and Frege's theory had an inconsistency. That's in a way a sign of how rigorous they were that you can actually find an inconsistency in. Um, it's also an irony that, uh, that happens to logicians most of all. Gödel, by contrast, says explicitly that since mathematics needs in some way to justify its axioms, to justify its axioms, which cannot be proved or simply defined into existence, it must attain, quote, a clarification of meaning that does not consist in giving definitions, end quote. For assistance in this task, Gödel turned to the philosopher Edmund Husserl's phenomenology, which he thought offered hope that we could find a systematic method that would achieve a clarification of meaning by, quote, this is Gödel now, by focusing more sharply on the concepts themselves by directing our attention onto our own acts of the use of these concepts, end quote, by an internal reflection of our own activities as a mathematician. It remains unclear, however, whether in the end Gödel found that the promise of Husserl was fulfilled. I myself can get nothing out of Husserl, <laughs> though I've I certainly tried. Um, the challenge posed by Gödel, however, remains. If mathematics is to deserve the name of a science, then like all sciences, it must seek the truth, including the truth of its axioms. Unlike mathematicians, physicists often investigate the nature of the objects under investigation. Einstein, for example, tells us what time itself is, the fourth dimension of a special kind of space, space-time, what energy is, E equals mc squared, what gravity is, space-time curvature. Similarly, before Watson and Crick, much was known about the gene, except what it actually is, which is what Watson and Crick told us. If mathematicians have no interest or ability in determining what numbers, say, are, perhaps philosophers can help them out. Properly taught, I suggest, mathematics should serve as a springboard for metaphysical and theological reflections, a source uh, for one, among other uh, um, tasks, of analogies. Consider, even a very large, finite natural number is no closer to infinity than the very smallest of numbers just as no human being, no matter how great, is any closer to God than the least among us. That's, I think, food for thought. Um, even a really, 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 really big number is just as far from infinity from, as the number two and three, but literally as close to two and three. Um, um, further, which my students often find very unpleasant, uh, so uh, but it's, a, it's a very sort of strange fact. So how do people learn about infinity by considering big numbers? That's another question, <laughs> another sort of mystery. Um, um, they do, somehow. Um, um. Further, the very existence of infinity, actual infinity, points us towards something mysterious and beautiful. Frege reaches infinity in an amazingly clear and beautiful way in the Grundlagen. The number, he says, that belongs to the concept, finite number, is an infinite number. I cannot agree, however, with Frege when he goes on to add that, quote, about the number, he uses the lemnus gate, uh, infinity, so defined, there is nothing mysterious or wonderful, end quote. That the number, that numbers, the natural numbers, is not itself a natural number, but rather a supernatural number, is to me the very essence of something mysterious and wonderful, in just the sense in which there is something mysterious and wonderful in Cantor's proof, that this supernatural or, as he calls them, transfinite numbers, this supernatural or transfinite number is only the first of an infinite series of transfinite numbers, not to mention the proof that this infinity of infinities cannot itself be numbered by any of the infinities contained therein. Um, if these things are not wonderful, I don't know what is wonderful. By the way, just, uh, just to remind you, 
the Cantor discovers a whole hierarchy of infinities. The, the smallest one numbers, the natural numbers, that's Frege's one. Then there's Aleph 1, Aleph 2, Aleph 3, etc. Exactly what Aleph 1 is is a good question. That's Cantor's continuing hypothesis. But he does prove uh, by the power set axiom that every set has a bigger set, including. So there's actually an infinite hierarchy of infinities. But how big an infinity of infinities? The answer is none of the infinite numbers, the Alephs, is big enough. Cantor has a name for the infinite, infinite list of infinities. He calls it God. And he says it's not mathematizable. He says, he says math can't handle that. Um, OK. If that's not wonderful, I don't know what's wonderful. Um, um, um. The significance of the actuality of actual infinity cannot be exaggerated. Actual infinity versus potential infinity. Um, though Cantor's uh, great discovery remains to some extent controversial. Not for nothing does Aristotle, following Plato, declare the divine to be pure actuality. Indeed, since he identifies potentiality with materiality, Aristotle, this is one of the reasons he concludes that God, the unmoved mover, as pure actuality, cannot be material. No potential, no, 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 no material. Be all you can be, announces a well-known poster for the U.S. Army. You may have seen these. In fact, that's only true of God. Whatever the Army tells you, they're, they're lying. <laughs> Uh, consider further, if a three-dimensional object, these are more analogies from mathematics, I think that should help theology. Consider further, if a three-dimensional object, say a sphere, moves through the plane of two-dimensional flatland, as in the book Flatland, what will the flatlander see? Uh, they'll see a series of circles, smaller and bigger and then smaller again. They won't see a three-dimensional sphere because it's a two-dimensional flatland. And, of course, no one can prove to them that there are such things as, as spheres. There may be some Moses among them hypothesize that there's a higher being. But of course, you can never prove them wrong. And I think the same is true of God, no matter how he may appear in this flat world of ours. Don't look for proof. Um, um, um. Mathematics teaches us that the invisible is real. Indeed, that the invisible realm orders or gives form to the visible. Just as Plato taught, that's one of the main themes of Plato's Vita, is that the invisible realm not only exists, but in fact it gives order and form to the visible realm. A very unintuitive idea, you may, you may think. Um, Plato also taught, where there is order, there is intelligence. A very interesting idea. Frege's philosophical explorations on the foundations of the theory of numbers is also, read correctly, a valuable tool in coming to grips with theological concepts. I think I'm sort of alone in bringing together Frege and theology. <laughs> uh, indeed, the lessons of Frege, that mathematics should proceed like a science, like any proper science, that is, as, as a form of systematic knowledge, seem to have been lost by mathematicians, and so an indispensable tool for grasping theological concepts has been lost. Let us begin with the number one, and work up to three. God is one. I think Paul just quoted this, this saying, God is one, we read the Bible, say the monotheistic religions. But what does this mean, that God is one? Frege in the Grundlagen emphasizes the distinction between being one in number and being unified, even though unus is a root of both. Being simple is yet a third idea. Being unified or united is a property of an object like the United States of America. Being one in number, by contrast, is a second-order property, the property a concept has of having exactly one instance. That's Frege's philosophy. God may or may not be unified, but this is not the idea behind monotheism. Rather, the idea that there is one and only one instance, rather the idea is that there is one and only one instance of the concept, God. So I'm claiming that you can't even understand monotheism unless you have some idea of the philosophy of arithmetic. Um, um, God is one sounds like God is wise and God is good, but it's actually not such a property of, of God. And then people simply say God is simple, that's, that's a different property of, of, of God. It is not really God then that is one, it is the concept of being God or being divine that has one unique instance. One cannot even grasp the basic idea of monotheism then without some understanding of the philosophy of arithmetic, which I think is not usually taught in theology schools, though I haven't actually <laughs> gone to one, I, I so suppose which unfortunately is taught, it seems, by philosophers, and not too many of those, not by mathematicians, even though Frege was a mathematician. Which brings us to the number three. Now we've moved up to three. My 